Hi. Today we're going to read together the short story, Thank You, Ma'am, by Langston Hughes. And I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite short stories, um, in part because I could totally see myself doing what one of the characters in the story did. But to back up, here in um, Unit 1, we've been looking at the story Good Samaritan. And the whole theme here is what influences a person's choices. We decide for ourselves. Things happen to us, but ultimately we decide what we are going to do. And different things happen because of different choices. I wanted to point out two rather different opinions here on what influences a person's choices. Albert Einstein here says that everything is determined the beginning as well as the end, uh, by forces over which we have no control. So basically he said, the story's already been written, nothing you can do about it. But Oprah Winfrey writes, with every experience, you alone are painting your own canvas, thought by thought, choice by choice. And I have to say that I definitely go more along with what Oprah has to say. We make decisions and that makes the person that we are. We saw the decisions that Ray made and now we'll see some other decisions by some new characters in the short story. Thank you, ma'am. So I'm gonna jump ahead here to page 40 so we can take a quick look at the vocabulary. And here we have the vocabulary from the story. I'll be following along on my iPad because my eyes are just a tad weak. So the first word we have here is circumstances. Why don't you repeat it with me? Circumstances, circumstances. And circumstances describe the situation that a person is in. There are many circumstances that cause people to make bad choices. Next word, commit. This is a verb, commit. And a person who commits a crime is the one who carries it out or does it. She committed the crime. Commit does have another meaning. If you commit to something, that means you're promising to do it. But if you commit something, then you are doing it. He committed a crime. He's the person who did a crime. Commit in that way has a bad connotation. If you use the word commit, to commit something, there's no way to commit a good thing. You can't say he, um, I don't know, he committed a surprise. You know, to surprise someone, make them happy. No, commit a crime. Next word is consequence. Consequence. So a consequence is something that happens as a result of another action. And this is another word that has a connotation. The word connotation means that a word has yet another meaning. For example, if we talk about things that have to do with how something smells. We have words that have different connotations. You know, the scent of something is the smell of it. Aroma is just talking about the smell. But if I say the stench of something, that's also talking about smell, but stench connotes something that smells bad. Consequence, as they say, something that happens as a result of something else, a consequence is usually a bad thing. It's like the opposite of a reward. You do something good, you get a reward. You do something bad, you have a consequence. Those are both results of doing something. Reward is doing something good, you get for doing something good, and a consequence is what you get 
for doing something bad. Next, we have the word contact. This can be a verb or a noun. To contact somebody, to call them, that's the verb. But this is a noun. So when you are in contact with people or things, you connect with them some way. So I'm still in contact with my friends from first grade. I wish that were true, but I am still in contact with my friends from high school. Empathy. You may have word, heard the word sympathy. Well, when you, and sympathy, you know, you kind of feel for another person, but when you have empathy, you feel like you understand their problems, their feelings, their behavior. It's almost like you can imagine being that other person. And for example, it would be used in the sentence, I feel empathy for the lonely boy and could feel his sadness. So one of the reasons why a person can feel empathy for someone else is they've been through a similar situation. If you can, you know, something, something bad is all sorts or good has happened to you and you can imagine how somebody else feels. And this is one of the things that you need to use as a good reader is try to imagine yourself in these situations as you read them and you will have empathy for the characters and it will help you understand the choices that some characters make, it will also surprise you. The choices that some characters make will surprise you because you will imagine it going a different way. Next word we have is juvenile. It can be an adjective, it can also be a noun. So using it, if you say a juvenile is a young person, that's the noun. But when something is juvenile, we're using it as an adjective and um, we're talking about it being for something, for someone who's younger. Um, it can also be kind of an insult to say something is juvenile. It's like you know, only a little kid would do it, using it as an insult. Um, maturity. You're in high school. Maturity is something that your teachers, your parents talk to you about a lot. So when people reach maturity, they are fully developed and have all their all the abilities of an adult. The girl's serious and responsible actions showed maturity. So maturity is a behavior. It can be a physical maturity, how somebody grows, but an emotional and mental maturity is in how a person behaves and reacts to things. And finally, we have the verb salvage. To salvage is to save something from, to save someone or something from destruction. And I really like the example that they made for this. I salvaged my friendship by telling my friend I was sorry. It's important. Saying you're sorry, that's one of the best lessons I ever learned. And you know how I learned it? Because when I was a child, not a single adult in my life ever told me that they were sorry. And I remember how much that hurt me. So I do remember to tell people that I'm sorry when I find myself at fault for something. So let's, so I keep saying so, I want to stop that. We're going to look at characterization in this story. Characterization, okay, you know what a character is. That's the person in the story. Characterization helps you figure out who that person is by what you are told in the story. It's not going to be, you're not going to find out about a character as if it's just a little, you know, summary that they give you. You have to figure these things out. So you have to look for details that you learn about the character as the story is being told. And you also look for details. You learn about a person who, um, 
by, by the things that they do. You know, for example, uh, you know, I, I used to do this when I was in the classroom. It's not going to work so well here on the screen. But, you know, if, if a teacher walks into the classroom and greets everybody by name and asks how they're doing, how would you characterize that teacher? What kind of a person are they? But if a character, if a teacher were to come into the room All right, did you do your homework? How would you characterize that kind of a teacher? So actions can give you information about the character. What other people say about them, all these different things. So here's a look in the text about one of the characters, one of the main characters in the story. Sorry, I'm trying to pull it up on my... She was a large woman with a large purse that had everything in it but a hammer and nails. It had a long strap and she carried it slung over her shoulder. It was about 11 o'clock at night, dark, and she was walking alone when a boy ran up behind her and tried to snatch her purse. The strap broke with a sudden single tug the boy gave it from behind. But the boy's weight? and the weight of the purse combined to cause him to lose his balance. Instead of taking off full blast as he had hoped, the boy fell on his back on the sidewalk and his legs flew up. The large woman simply turned around and kicked him right square in his blue jean sitter. Then she reached down, picked the boy up by his shirt front, and shook him until his teeth rattled. That paints quite a picture. So when you are looking at this, first they're describing the women's, woman's physical traits, what she looks like, what she's carrying, this, everything like that. And then you have her actions. The boy tried to steal her purse. He didn't get away. She kicked him right in his bottom. And then she picked him up and she shook him. Think about it. What would you do if somebody ran up to you and tried to steal something from you? We might think we're doing, we would do one thing. You know, I might think I'd act like that woman, but maybe I'd just be kind of frozen I can't believe this is happening to me. No. <laughs> she was very much, how dare you do this to me? So think about what kind of a woman that is and what you think she might do in future. So as you're reading, let me, sorry, let me pull this up a little. So as you're reading, read things again if you're not sure about what you read. So if something's, you know, they make a good point. I'm not sure why other people didn't stop to help the woman. Well, it's 11 o'clock at night. How many people are walking around at that time? And then just keep thinking as the author gives you more information. The boy, the boy must have gotten hurt when he fell on his back. And I think he was more hurt after she kicked him too. But later you get more information it is as it shows here that the boy probably was okay because she said if i let go of you are going to run away and he said yeah so he must have been okay so those are a few things uh, to keep in mind keep thinking about your own experiences predict think ahead to what you what you would do if you were the boy or you were the woman and that'll help you look, it'll help you tell the story in your mind and understand it better. So just a brief look at Langston Hughes, who wrote this story. 
Um, he wrote poems as well, beautiful poems. And he was part of the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s and 1920s and 30s. I can't just say 20s and 30s because it's 2020. Uh, one of his poems, a line in his poem, sparked a beautiful play by uh, Lorraine Hansberry, Raisin in the Sun. So his work influenced other people's work and you know they fed off of each other. They sparked each other's thoughts. There's just so, I don't, I don't, there's not enough time. There's not enough time in the day to learn about all of this for myself. When I get, re when I'm retired, I'm going to be doing so much more reading. But Langston Hughes is a wonderful author, and I hope you'll look at some of his other stories. But right now we're going to look at the story, Thank You, Ma'am, by Langston Hughes. And always... Take advantage of the fact that we have images in this book to help tell the story. I tell you to take the words and make a picture in your mind, but they do help you with that. So first off, again, 11 o'clock at night, this doesn't look like any of our Sacramento neighborhoods. We don't have multiple story apartment buildings. Um, on the main street like this. So you can see it's densely populated. A lot of people living close to each other, living over stores. So it's more like the middle of a city. And in living in the middle of a city, you know, what is there for children to do? There's a lot of activity going on in this picture. So ask yourself as you're looking at this, what is the neighborhood like? How would the scene change at night? Because as we saw, it was 11 o'clock at night. So here we are. Thank you, ma'am, by Langston Hughes. We're going to find out the consequences for a young person who makes the choice to commit a crime. She was a large woman with a large purse that had everything in it but a hammer and nails. It had a long strap and she carried it slung across her shoulder. It was about 11 o'clock at night, dark, and she was walking alone when a boy ran up behind her and tried to snatch her purse. But the boy's weight and the sudden single, sorry, the strap broke with the sudden single tug the boy gave it from behind. But the boy's weight and the weight of the purse combined and the weight of the purse combined caused him to lose his balance. Instead of taking off full blast as he had hoped, and this is called purse snatching. You just run past somebody, grab their purse, keep going. So instead of Instead of taking off full blast as he had hoped, the boy fell on his back. Sorry, my page got small. The boy fell on his back on the sidewalk and his legs flew up. You know, I'm sorry. Even I would kind of laugh, I think, if I saw that. The large woman simply turned around and kicked him right square in his blue jeaned sitter. So this is being a little bit polite. Didn't say she kicked him in his butt, which is where she kicked him. His blue jeaned sitter. Because you sit on it, don't you? Then she reached down, picked the boy up by his shirt front, and shook him until his teeth rattled. So think about it. Just in this one paragraph. What ideas are forming in your mind about these two characters? What's the woman like? And what's the boy like? What do you think of a boy who tries to steal? After that, the woman said, pick up my pocketbook boy and give it here. She still held him tightly. But she bent down enough to permit him to stoop and pick up her purse. 
Then she said, Now ain't you ashamed of yourself? Firmly gripped by the shirt front, the boy said, Yes, am The woman said, What did you do it for? The boy said, I didn't aim to. What does he mean by that? She's asking him why he tried to steal her purse, and he tells her, I didn't mean to. He can accidentally steal a purse? What do you think he means? She said, you a lie. By that time, two or three people passed, stopped, turned to look, and some stood watching. If I turn you loose, will you run? asked the woman. Yes, am said the boy. Then I won't turn you loose, said the woman. She did not release him. Lady, I'm sorry, whispered the boy. And a reminder here, as you're reading through this story, you have the words that we talked about in the beginning, but also we have some bold words here to help you understand what's going on in the story. Mm-hmm. Your face is dirty. I got a great mind to wash your face for you. Ain't you got nobody home to tell you to wash your face? No, said the boy. Then it will get washed this evening, said the large woman, starting up the street, dragging the frightened boy behind her. He looked as if he were 14 or 15, frail and willow wild, in tennis shoes and blue jeans. The woman said, you ought to be my son. I would teach you right from wrong. The least I can do right now is to wash your face. Are you hungry? No, said the being dragged boy. I just want you to turn me loose. Now, a note here about the language. Authors often use familiar words in new ways. And here, Hughes uses the being dragged boy. So how does this help you picture what's happening? He's using it as an adjective. You could say the tall girl, you know, the fast boy, the singing mother, whatever, the being dragged boy. He doesn't have a choice here. He's being taken along. So here's another picture to show you New York City, which is where Harlem is. Harlem Renaissance, Harlem was a neighborhood, is a neighborhood in New York City. So in looking at the colors of here, the night, you know, think about the mood, how you feel about the way that the city looks and imagine it 11 o'clock at night. Was I bothering you when I turned that corner? Asked the woman. No. But you put yourself in contact with me, said the woman. If you think that that contact is not going to last a while, you got another thought coming. When I get through with you, sir, you are going to remember Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones. So have you ever known someone who talks in a tough, bossy way like that? Yeah, Mrs. Job. What does her language tell you about her character? What does what she's saying tell you about her character? The boy tried to steal her purse. And what's she going to do now? Talking about washing his face. Asking him if he's hungry. What kind of a person does that? 
Sweat popped out on the boy's face, and he began to struggle. Mrs. Jones stopped, jerked him around in front of her, put a half Nelson around his neck, if you guys watch WWE, and continued to drag him up the street. <laughs> I just, I love this image of it. You know, what she's doing with him does not match what she's saying. She's dragging him up to wash his face and feed him. When she got to her door, she dragged the boy inside, turned down a hall and into a large kitchenette furnished room at the rear of the house. She, sh she switched on the light and left the door open. The boy could hear other rumors laughing and talking in the large house. So maybe it's her own home or maybe not, but she shares the home with other people. When we put the word or the little phrase et, E-T-T-E -E, on the end of something, it's to make it seem smaller, a kitchenette. So it's a very small kitchen. The boy could hear other rumors laughing and talking in the large house. Some of their doors were open too. So he knew that he and the woman were not alone. The woman still had him by the neck in the middle of her room. She said, what is your name? Roger, answered the boy. Then Roger, you go to that sink and wash your face, said the woman, whereupon she turned him loose at last. Roger looked at the door, looked at the woman, looked at the door, and went to the sink. So, why was he looking at the door? What do you think? Looking at the woman, looking at the door. What would you have done? Would you have tried to get away? I guess he thought maybe he wasn't going to be able to get away. He went and did what she told him to do. Let the water run until it gets warm, she said. Here's a clean towel. You gonna take me to jail? Asked the boy, bending over the sink. <laughs> not with that face. I would not take you nowhere, said the woman. And we've got a picture here of a strong looking woman just like Miss Luella Bates Washington Jones, perhaps. So here we're thinking, he asked about jail. She kind of made a joke about it. Not with that face, I'm not taking you to jail. So why wouldn't she take him there? Why would she instead keep him at home and wash his face, have him wash his face, ask him if he's hungry, be willing to feed him? Why is she being kind to him after he tried to steal from her? Why do people do that? Because it happens often. And the answer is there at the top. There's a life lesson. She believes that taking him to the police is not going to be what helps him right now. She thinks that she can help him more than that. And that's why she's keeping him there with her. So let's see what kind of a lesson she wants to try and teach him. Here I am trying to get home to cook me a bite to eat and you snatch my pocketbook. Pocketbook's an old fashioned word for a purse. Maybe you ain't been to your supper either late as it be, have you? There's nobody home at my house, said the boy. Then we'll eat, said the woman. I believe you're hungry or have been hungry. I believe you're hungry or been hungry to try to snatch my pocketbook. 
I want a pair of blue suede shoes, said the boy. Well, you didn't have to snatch my pocketbook to get some suede shoes, said Miss Luella Bates Washington Jones. You could have asked me. So thinking here, what does this dialogue, dialogue, what they're saying with each other, what does this show you about Mrs. Jones from what you know of her so far? Would she have helped Roger if he had asked her for the money? Ma'am? The water dripping from his face, the boy looked at her. There was a long pause, a very long pause. After he had dried his face and not knowing what else to do, dried it again, the boy turned around wondering what next. The door was open. He could make a dash for it down the hall. He could run, 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 run. The woman was sitting on the day bed. After a while, she said, I were young once and I wanted things I could not get. There was another long pause. The boy's mouth opened. Then he frowned, not knowing he frowned. The woman said, mm-hmm. You thought I was going to say, but, didn't you? You thought I was going to say, but I didn't snatch people's pocketbook. Well, I wasn't going to say that. Pause. Silence. I have done things too, which I would not tell you, son. Neither tell God if he didn't already know. Everybody's got something in common. Does that make sense to you? If it doesn't, take a moment to reread the paragraph to understand what you what it might be that she and Roger have in common. I'm going to back it up again. I were young once and I wanted things I could not get. So that's something she has in common with Roger. She understood that. So you sit down while I fix us something to eat. You might run that comb through your hair so you look presentable. He looked like he was about 14 or 15 years old. Does that look like a happy face? In another corner of the room behind the screen was a gas plate and an ice box. Ice box is like a small refrigerator. Gas plate would be like the oven that you would cook on. Mrs. Jones got up and went behind the screen. The woman did not watch the boy to see if he was going to run now, if he was going to run now, nor did she watch her purse, which she left behind her on the daybed. But the boy took care to sit on the far side of the room away from the purse, where he thought she could easily see him out of the corner of her eye. So the screen, it's like having a curtain. Can't see through it. So she's, you know, got things partitioned off, different sections. And he wants her to know what does he want her to know? By sitting where she can see him? What is she showing him by leaving those things there, by leaving the door open, by leaving her purse by him?
So think back to the beginning. He tried to steal her purse. Instead of taking him to the police, she takes him home, gets him washed up, is giving him dinner, and leaves him sitting by her purse with an open door. She's showing him that she wants to trust him. And because he is sitting so that she can see him, he's showing that he wants her to trust him. So, okay. The boy took care to sit on the far side of the room, away from the purse, where he thought she could easily see him out of the corner of her eye if she wanted to. He did not trust the woman not to trust him, and he did not want to be mistrusted now. Do you need somebody to go to the store? asked the boy. Maybe to get some milk or something? So think about what he's saying and why he might be saying that. Don't believe I do, said the woman. Unless you just want sweet milk yourself. I was going to make cocoa out of this canned milk here. That will be fine, said the boy. She heated some lima beans and ham she had in the icebox, made the cocoa and set the table. The woman did not ask the boy anything about where he lived or his folks or anything else that would embarrass him. Now stop a moment and think, why would he be embarrassed at being asked about his family? What idea did you get about his family when she asked him, do you have anybody at home to wash your face, to feed you? And he said, there's no one at home. The woman did not ask the boy anything about where he lived or his folks or anything else that would embarrass him. Instead, as they ate, she told him about her job in a hotel beauty shop that stayed open late, what the work was like and how all kinds of women came in and out, blondes and redheads and Spanish, and then she cut him a half of her 10 cent cake. So think about it. Why is she telling him so much about herself and not about not asking questions about him? Think back to what she said a few, was it the last, no, two pages ago. Everybody's got something in common. So she's trying to develop a rapport, a little relationship between herself and the boy by telling him about herself. When they finished eating, she got up and said, now here, take this $10 and buy yourself some blue suede shoes. And next time, do not make the mistake of latching onto my pocketbook nor nobody else's because shoes got by devilish ways will burn your feet. I got to get my rest now, but from here on in, son, I hope you will behave yourself. She led him down the hall to the front door and opened it. Good night. Behave yourself, boy, she said, looking out into the street as he went down the steps. The boy wanted to say something other than, thank you, ma'am, to Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones. But although his lips moved, he couldn't even say that as he turned at the foot of the barren stoop and looked up at the large woman in the door. And then she shut the door.
one of my favorite stories. So in talking about the story, we're going to analyze, which means look and figure things out. So using some details from the story, explain why Mrs. Jones wants Roger to learn the lessons she's teaching him. Think about people who've taught, tried to teach you lessons, and I'm not talking about school. It's how to grow up to be a good man or a woman. How do you do this? What are the lessons that you learn? And what might the consequences be if you ignore those lessons? Think about how Mrs. Jones showed that she had empathy for Roger. What were some of the things she said or did that showed empathy? And we'll talk a little bit about some of the characterizations. So you can make yourself a little chart and go back, reread the story. What types of clues tell you more about the characters? What were some of the physical traits, the way they looked that told you about the people? Their thoughts. We heard Roger's thoughts. Did we hear or learn any of Mrs. Bates, excuse me, of Mrs. Luella Bates Washington Jones's thoughts in this story? That's something to look at. So also the words they use, the actions, and the reactions. So when somebody said something, what did the other person think or do about it? So try and make this chart. These, this is what you're going to write out for this lesson, and then you'll be discussing it more in the flip grid. Okay, and things to think about. What influenced Roger's choices? Why did he choose to try and steal something? Why did he choose to not run away when he could run away? Why was he making those choices? And as you make those decisions, use the text. Sorry, here's back. Use at least two pieces of evidence from the text. So if you're telling me he decided not to run, how do you know that? And why do you think he made that decision? What does it say in the story to make you think that? So thank you for reading Thank You, Ma'am, with me by, Mr. by Langston Hughes. Until our next story, bye.